how quantitative easing really works and why it matters. Imagine a world where money flows like water, created at will, flooding through the economy to keep it alive. That world exists. It's called quantitative easing, or QE, one of the most powerful and misunderstood tools in modern finance. At its core, QE is a monetary policy used by central banks to stimulate growth when traditional methods no longer work. But while the concept sounds simple, printing money to revive the economy, what happens behind the scenes is far more complex and its effects ripple across the entire world. When a central bank launches quantitative easing, it creates digital money, not physical cash, but new reserves on its balance sheet. Using this money, it buys government bonds and sometimes other securities from commercial banks and financial institutions. This process injects liquidity into the system. The banks that sell those bonds suddenly have more cash. And when banks have more cash, they can lend more to businesses, to homeowners, to investors. The result? Lower interest rates, higher borrowing, and a push for spending and investment. In theory, this chain reaction drives economic growth. Businesses expand. Consumers spend. Stock markets rise. The system breathes again. But quantitative easing isn't a magic switch. It's a delicate balancing act. When a central bank buys massive amounts of bonds, it pushes bond prices up and yields down. That means borrowing becomes cheaper, but it also distorts how markets normally function. Investors no longer satisfied with low bond returns move their money into stocks, real estate, and commodities, pushing prices even higher. At first, this looks like prosperity, but it can quietly inflate asset bubbles where prices rise far beyond their real value. If those bubbles burst, the same system meant to protect the economy can end up destabilizing it. Let's step back to 2008, the height of the global financial crisis. Banks were collapsing. Credit had frozen. Economies were on the brink. That's when the U.S. Federal Reserve stepped in with an unprecedented move. It began buying hundreds of billions of dollars worth of government bonds and mortgage-backed securities. This was the birth of modern quantitative easing. Over time, central banks in Europe, Japan, and the UK followed the same path. And for a while, it worked. Markets recovered. Unemployment fell. Confidence returned. But QE didn't affect everyone equally. Here's the hidden side of the story. When the central bank injects liquidity, most of it first flows into financial assets, not directly into the hands of everyday people. That's why the wealthy, who own most of the stocks and real estate, benefit the most. Their assets rise in value, while ordinary workers often see little change in their wages. This dynamic has quietly widened the wealth gap, fueling debates about inequality and financial fairness. In other words, quantitative easing didn't just rescue the system, it reshaped it. Critics also argue that QE makes markets dependent on central banks. Every time growth slows, investors expect another round of easy money. It becomes like a financial drug, temporarily soothing pain, but never addressing the root causes. Meanwhile, governments might delay tough reforms, knowing that central banks will step in to support markets. This can lead to an artificial sense of stability, where economies look healthy on paper, but remain fragile underneath. Still, it's important to recognize what QE has achieved. Without it, the 2008 crisis could have triggered a complete global depression. It gave time for recovery, for businesses to rebuild, for confidence to return. Central banks today see QE as part of their standard toolkit. During the COVID-19 pandemic, for instance, they launched trillions of dollars in bond purchases to keep economies afloat. Once again, stock markets soared, even as millions lost jobs. The irony? QE can make the financial world look strong, even when the real economy struggles. Now, let's talk about inflation, the natural side effect of flooding the system with money. When there's more money chasing the same amount of goods, prices rise. If QE goes too far, inflation can spiral, reducing the value of savings, hurting consumers, and forcing central banks to raise interest rates rapidly to cool things down. 
That's exactly what happened in 2021 and 2022. Years of loose monetary policy combined with supply shocks drove inflation to its highest levels in decades. The same tool that once saved the economy now became a risk to it. And as interest rates rose sharply, the cost of borrowing surged, cooling housing markets, slowing investment, and even triggering banking stress across several economies. It showed that QE's after effects don't just fade away, they echo for years. Another often overlooked consequence is how QE shapes currencies and global markets. When a central bank like the Federal Reserve increases money supply, the US dollar tends to weaken, making exports cheaper and imports more expensive. But since the dollar is the world's reserve currency, QE in the US affects everyone. Countries with currencies tied to the dollar feel the pressure. Emerging economies see capital flows shift overnight. Even the price of commodities, from oil to gold, can swing wildly depending on how much money central banks are pumping into the system. In short, quantitative easing doesn't just influence one country's economy, it quietly reshapes the world's financial balance. So where does QE go from here? Central banks are now exploring ways to unwind their massive balance sheets, a process called quantitative tightening, or QT. Instead of buying bonds, they let them mature or even sell them back into the market. This drains liquidity, raises interest rates, and aims to cool down inflation. But it's a risky move, like taking oxygen away from a recovering patient. Withdraw too much and growth collapses. Withdraw too little and inflation keeps burning. Finding the right balance has become one of the hardest challenges in modern monetary policy. For investors, understanding QE is like understanding the tide. You don't control it, but if you can read its direction, you can position yourself ahead of the wave. When central banks signal new rounds of easing, assets like stocks, gold, and real estate often rise. When they tighten, those same assets can fall sharply. Knowing this helps you anticipate trends rather than react to them. In the end, quantitative easing is both a savior and a risk. A reminder that in the world of finance, power always comes with consequences. It shows how money, confidence, and policy intertwine, and how decisions made inside central banks ripple through every part of the economy, from Wall Street to Main Street. Because QE isn't just about printing money. It's about rewriting the rules of value, risk, and recovery. There's still so much more to uncover about how modern financial systems work and how they quietly shape your life. Stay curious, stay informed, and keep exploring the hidden mechanics of global economics right here with Wealthlens.